From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. On Monday night, the news publication Politico leaked a draft of a majority Supreme Court opinion written by Justice Alito. The draft details the highly anticipated decision in the case of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, known more broadly to the public as the case that could overturn Roe v. Wade. Supreme Court decisions typically don't come out until June, but this leaked draft, confirmed by Justice Alito himself, has sent early shockwaves across the country. In the draft majority opinion, Justice Alito writes that both Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, decisions that have been on the books for up to 50 years, are overturned, making access to abortion no longer a legally protected right. Should this draft hold, this decision would turn back the clock on progress for people who can get pregnant and call into question much more than access to abortion. Joining us today to help us make sense of it all is Bridget Amiri, the Deputy Director of the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. Bridget, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Bridget, a lot has happened in the last day, and it's causing a lot of confusion, a lot of disbelief. At a high level, can you bring our listeners up to speed about what was leaked by Politico? Sure. So it appears to be a draft majority opinion written by Justice Alito overturning Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And what that means, if this is a true opinion that could be issued by the full court, that abortion will be banned in about half the states. And I know we'll talk more about what the impact will be, but what happened last night was a leak of a draft majority opinion written by Justice Alito saying that the Constitution no longer protects abortion. And what was your first reaction when you saw it? Were you in disbelief? Did you think that this was real? I was in disbelief. We have no idea, I think, independently, um, whether this was something that was authentic. It seems now that the Supreme Court has acknowledged that this was an authentic draft. Uh, It's dated February, so presumably it's a little bit outdated. But when it first hit the airwaves, I was skeptical of whether it was authentic or not. Um, But to be honest, we have been preparing for the possibility that the Supreme Court could overturn Roe just based on the questions that the justices asked in this case. So in that sense, it's not a total shock that this is possibly where the court is going. So I want to reiterate for everyone that this was a draft. What can we tell our listeners about the ways in which justices deliberate and write opinions? So you're right, it's just a draft. This isn't an opinion. People who have abortion appointments scheduled today should go to their appointments. This doesn't change the law now. It may change it if this is the opinion. But we know that drafts go back and forth among the different justices until there's a majority that people have signed on to. There are nine justices. You need five votes to have a majority opinion. And other people might write concurrences or dissents uh, based on what the majority is going to say. So it is a back and forth process um, among the justices. And so this draft from February is a draft that was circulated apparently uh, based on the news reports. And where it will end up is unclear. Before we dig in further, I just want to reiterate what you said about people being able to access abortion currently, that this isn't the law of the land yet. How can people who want to support folks who need access to abortion care in the immediate, what can they do? Where can they go to support people right now? So I would say tap into your local reproductive rights, justice, and health community. Find out how you can be involved. Donate to your local abortion fund, practical support organizations that make sure people can access the care. These are all you know, critically important in terms of the existing infrastructure that exists to make sure people can get care and that will just need to be invested in. And contact your local representatives, contact your senators. Um, This is a time now to let your elected officials know where you stand on this issue and how important it is to you. Exactly. So 
I want to go back to the actual case at hand. This is a draft opinion that was leaked for the case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. It was argued in December. Can you remind us about this case? Where did the case originate and what did the arguments detail? Sure. So this is a case brought by our friends at the Center for Reproductive Rights. They represent the last abortion clinic in Mississippi. The law is whether the state can ban abortion at 15 weeks in pregnancy. But the question that the Supreme Court took up for review is whether all pre-viability abortion bans are constitutional. So a very broad question that was accepted for review by the Supreme Court. And right there, the Supreme Court taking this question that has been settled for decades, as you said before, was really disconcerting. We were very, very nervous about why the Supreme Court would take a case involving a question that has been settled for decades. And we know the answer, which is that there have been significant changes on the Supreme Court. Donald Trump vowed to put Supreme Court justices on the bench that would overturn Roe versus Wade. And that may be what happens. But the case itself is a 15-week abortion ban in Mississippi. And the question, though, is much broader. How did the question leave open the opportunity that Roe v. Wade could be fully overturned? Well, I think part of it is you can't uphold a 15-week abortion ban without overturning Roe or dismantling Roe. And the state of Mississippi asked the Supreme Court not just to uphold their case, but to consider the constitutionality of abortion in general and whether the Constitution protects abortion at all. So there was that direct invitation from the state of Mississippi to overturn Roe v. Wade and to overturn Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And arguably, this has been the hope, the intent all along to have one of these state cases rise to the level that the Supreme Court could reconsider and potentially overturn Roe. Absolutely. I mean, there's a 50-year strategy from the other side to both push abortion out of reach, to ban it entirely, and the states were racing to be the ones that got a case up to the Supreme Court to see whether Roe could be overturned. Yeah, so before we discuss the domino effect of how this draft opinion calls into question so many more rights, I want to focus on what the country would look like if Roe fell. Many states have trigger laws on the books. Can you explain what trigger laws are and how an overturn of Roe will further patchwork the country's abortion access? Sure. So about half the states will ban abortion almost immediately. And half the states will allow abortion to be provided, they're not going to stop at overturning Roe. And what they want is a nationwide ban on abortion. And so even in states where Roe, the overturn of Roe right now, doesn't mean that abortion will be eliminated, doesn't mean that in the long term it won't. So if you're in a state like New York or California and you think that you will have access to abortion even if Roe versus Wade is overturned, that is true in the short term. But what everyone needs to also understand is that the next long-term plan from the other side, and maybe not even that long-term, is to ban abortion nationwide. Uh, And we can also talk about the other rights that are implicated if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, like the right to contraception and LGBTQ rights. Yes. I want to talk briefly about what we've seen in the months following SB 8, which was the law in Texas that banned abortion at six weeks. It seems that that case, the Supreme Court allowing SB 8 to hold, had opened up the floodgates, it seemed, to have Kentucky and Oklahoma and other states across the country start to mimic what has happened in Texas. Can you just update us on what we've seen in in states like Kentucky and Oklahoma in recent weeks? Yes. So there is always this copycat sense among the states that in the race to the bottom to be the ones most restrictive of abortion rights, they copy what the other one is doing. And so we've seen that playbook. There's quite literally a playbook from the other side that then gets replicated by legislatures um, in different states. And so the SB8 law that you've mentioned in Texas was something we'd never seen before, which is a law that allows anyone to sue someone for providing an abortion after six weeks in pregnancy. 
and seek at least $10,000 in damages and prevent the provider from providing other abortions in violation of the law. And that has shut down abortion access after six weeks in pregnancy in Texas, um, forcing people who have the resources to flee the state to get care after that time. Uh, And for those who can't leave the state, they're forced to remain pregnant against their will. And what we've seen in surrounding states is uh, similar attempts like in Oklahoma. For example, you just mentioned Idaho passed similar bounty hunter laws like Texas did. Uh, In other states, we're seeing different types of restrictions. So Kentucky, for example, passed a 72-page law that took effect immediately. It was effectively, as one person called it, an abortion ban by red tape that it created a catch-22 for abortion providers, requiring them to come into a whole host of new laws, uh, compliance with new laws, but not giving them any time to do so. The law was effective immediately, and it was impossible to comply with, um, and it shut down abortion provision in Kentucky for a week before a judge could rule um, blocking the law. And so everything, you know, is very... I would say tenuous um, in the states, you know, where we are still battling to keep access and uh, in the surrounding states in particular with Texas, we are seeing people having fewer options or may see fewer options to in terms of travel and where to go. I want to pick up on what you've said about the lack of access and also the expectation that we had at some level, especially after SB8 and especially after the December 1st Dobbs arguments, that we could soon see an overturn of Roe. The greater community fighting to ensure reproductive freedom has been working day and night, you know this better than most, to provide stop gaps where we can for people who need to access an abortion. So I'm wondering if we could just at least detail a few options that people are working on in order to help folks in the event that all of this does come to full fruition, because I think folks are really, really concerned. And I, I want to be clear that, that we're also working on a lot of different options for people to have access, even if that would happen. Absolutely. And so, you know, on the litigation side of things, we've been holding the line in the states where we can, bringing defensive cases. But as you see, the federal courts are becoming more and more hostile, including, for example, in on the policy level for states that where abortion is going to be allowed, removing access through legislation to ensure that states that will allow abortion don't have restrictions so that people who travel to those states are able to get care quickly, easily, without hurdles um, and without obstacles. Um, So that is, you know, we've seen huge policy gains um, in a number of states over the last couple of years, um, New Jersey and Maine, um, many others where we will see abortion be more widely available available. We're also working on telehealth abortion and removing restrictions on access to medication abortion. And that will also be critical so that when people do cross into a state that uh, will allow abortion, that they might um, be able to be seen through medication abortion, telehealth abortion more easily. And, you know, we're also looking to state constitutions, and we've already seen this played out in other situations where state constitutions protect abortion greater than the federal constitution. And so we will also be looking at at places where already the state constitution protects abortion greater than the federal constitution, or that might be a new avenue. Thank you for detailing all of those efforts that people are going to to help fight back against this. So Texas is the place in the country that's living most closely like a post-Roe reality, but it's not the same as living before Roe. So I was wondering if you could kind of tease out the distinction there and talk about the kinds of ways that people are able to access abortion, even in the most dire circumstances. Absolutely. And so prior to Roe, there was a devastating impact on people who were accessing abortion outside the legal system, including that it was very dangerous and hospital wards routinely saw people coming in, women coming in as a result of abortions performed that were not safe and not legal. That's not the situation we will be in if Roe is overturned or even today for people who decide to self-manage their abortion. Medication abortion 
taken without medical supervision can be very safe. What is the danger is the criminalization of that. And so as we saw, a young Latinx woman was charged with murder in Texas for inducing an abortion by herself. And those charges were dropped later after the district attorney realized there was no basis in the law for doing that. But that is what we're going to see. And what we have seen in the past is the policing of pregnant people and the criminalization of pregnancy outcomes. And that criminalization and the consequences of that is going to be the real danger of self-induced abortion in modern times. I think it is really helpful for people to hear that. I want to dig into some of the other concerns that we have based on the rhetoric that was in the leaked draft of Justice Alito's majority decision. He says many concerning things. Uh, To start, he says that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start, quotes, because it doesn't have to do with the original intent of the Constitution. What do you make of this claim? It seems to me that there are a lot of decisions that have passed through the Supreme Court that don't have to, in quotes, do with the original intent of the Constitution or were part of the context in which the Constitution was written. I think that that's right. And if the view of the Constitution is based on what it was intended in the 1700s, written by white men, and to the exclusion of everybody else, then what does that mean for constitutional rights that are protecting right now people um, who don't fall into that category? So women, people of color, LGBT people, this is all of these issues in terms of the constitution and how it has been interpreted by the Supreme Court over the years really is concerning in terms of access to contraception, LGBT rights. Uh, If this is really where the Supreme Court is headed, that you only have a constitutional right, if it was contemplated by white men in the 1700s, then there's a whole host of issues that we work on here and that people care about in our country that are at risk. In seeking to justify this dismissal of pretty much anything that the framers of the Constitution were not considering at the time, Justice Alito explains that liberty, in quotes, isn't our ardent views, in quotes, of what freedoms we should have. And to that end, he he calls into question all these other Supreme Court cases that have settled, things that have given us gay marriage, uh, interracial marriage, the use of contraceptives. He hints at this possible ability for us to to attack bodily autonomy, which I think is especially a concern for trans folks, as we've already seen these kinds of laws pop up in state houses and state legislatures across the country. I wonder how this draft and this broad umbrella that Justice Alito is painting over all of these rights that don't fit again into this context of what the framers of the Constitution would have wanted. How does this open the door and show favorability, maybe even encourage state legislatures to usher some of these laws through? It's really concerning. It's not a secret that this is what Justice Alito has thought for years. And Justice Scalia before him and Justice Thomas, we we know this is where they stand. And so what is concerning is if they're writing the majority now, if this is the majority opinion, then you're right that all of these rights and values that we care so deeply about uh, could be up for grabs. And, you know, we've already seen other legislators talk about how Griswold versus Connecticut should be overturned. And that is the law that allowed um, people to access contraception under the Constitution. And so that right to privacy that was first enshrined in Griswold versus Connecticut then, you know, has been built on over the years um, to then ensure same-sex marriage. So we see these as building blocks um, and all of these issues are connected. And if you take away one piece of the building block, then the concern is, is that the wall gets weaker and, and that's what other people want and that maybe it will fall. And so that's, what's really terrifying about all of this too, is that the implications for all of these rights. In the draft opinion, Justice Alito refers to 
13th century treatise that claims that abortion is homicide. He also relies on medieval common law, where women are likened to chattel. Reading this draft, I was flabbergasted and could not seem to reconcile all of this. Arguably, I would imagine that when the decision actually finally does come out, that some of this language could be pulled back in the final draft. Despite that, it is hard to see this window into the logic and to, and honestly into a lot of political viewpoints of a sitting justice that has a lot of power and is now in the majority. How do we keep on knowing that these are the views, perspectives, and opinions of an institution that has largely tried to deem itself non-political? Right. So I think that those are all good points and maybe they don't make their way into the final majority opinion if that's what's going to happen. But as you say, we know these are Justice Alito's views and maybe this is, he writes a concurrence, even if this isn't in the majority. And so it is really, again, terrifying that this is uh, someone who is so powerful, holds these views about people's role in society and women's roles in society and historically. So it's not going to be the courts that are going to make the change. We can hold a line. We've been able to stop a lot of really bad things from happening by bringing our litigation. But in order to create a longstanding, really fundamental change, it's going to be different and look different. And so really, we need to be looking to those people who are organizing, you know, within the ACLU, our affiliates and their coalition on the ground and looking to the reproductive justice organizations and looking for the reproductive health organizations locally and figuring out what is going to be sustained change on this issue. What is it going to look like? What's people's short term plans in terms of enshrining the right, making sure people can access care? And then also, what is our vision for the long term? Roe versus Wade was was always the floor. It was the basic. Does the Constitution protect this right? It didn't mean that people had access, though. So already there were people who were living in parts of the country where it didn't matter if Roe existed or not because they didn't have access. So as devastating as this moment is, I think we take this moment and we think about our vision. What do we want? What is our vision for 50 years? And what does it mean to truly have reproductive freedom? And that means not just access to abortion and contraception, but it also means the ability to have children and parent them in the way that people see fit in a world free from police violence and with infrastructure in our communities um, to care for those children. So I think that this is also something that we all should be thinking about and really not looking to the courts to make that change. We have to look within our communities and think about the long term sustainability of reproductive freedom in this country. I think that those are all really important points. The Senate plans to vote again on the Women's Health Protection Act in the coming days. And our hope was that that could help codify abortion access in the country. How likely is it that it will pass? And how would this legislation impact access to abortion nationally? So it is important for this to pass. And if it were to pass, then it would enshrine the right to abortion in federal statutory law and would have impact on a lot of the state restrictions that we're seeing. But it's also not enough. I think right now everything is all tools in the toolbox. Yes, we need this and we need so much more. uh, And we need to really be thinking about what that looks like and listening to our partners on the ground about what that looks like. So yes, people should absolutely be contacting their senators and saying that they want the Women's Health Protection Act to pass. And also looking locally and within their communities about what is the priority and figuring out what that what that looks like. And what can our supporters do at this moment to try to make their voice heard right now beyond uh, what you've already outlined? I think one of the things that makes the ACLU really interesting is that we, you know, touch a lot of the cases that are called into question in this draft opinion. We are on the front lines and have the connective tissue, really, to protecting reproductive access, but also protecting interracial marriage, protecting gay marriage. What can people do to support 
our work, your work, the work of your colleagues? Yeah, so go to aclu.org and look at what we have on our website. Um, we have actions that people can take on all of these issues. Um, check out your local ACLU and um, check out your local reproductive rights and justice organizations to see how you can get involved, how you can support abortion funds, how you can volunteer, possibly at the local clinic. Uh, and I would say, you know, we've talked about the right to privacy issues that this encompasses, but also what's incredibly important is voting rights. The vast majority of people in this country support access to abortion, but because of the diminution of people's right to vote through gerrymandering and other restrictions on voting, the scale back of the Voting Rights Act, the work that our colleagues are doing in the voting rights arena is also so critically important so that we can then vote our values and really have people in office who reflect our our values. And that has been watered down so significantly because the right to vote has been so watered down because of all of the restrictions that have been put in place and that we're fighting against as well. So all of these issues that we work on at the ACLU are very connected. And uh, so any piece of this that people are interested, there's a way to get involved. I really appreciate that context, Bridget. Beyond your legal expertise, I wonder just on a personal level, you're a parent you have a family, what would you want to say to people who are advocating for an end to Roe from where you sit personally? The human suffering that is caused by abortion restrictions, abortion bans, and that the human suffering that will result if the, if Roe is overturned, I think you don't have to be a parent to have that empathy for people who want to make the decision, uh, who need to make the decision about whether to become a parent. You know, personally, as the mom of a daughter, like I am devastated at the prospect that she is going to grow up uh, in a country with fewer rights, that we're going back, we're going backwards. And, and that's what's scary, really scary as, as the parent of a school-aged kid. But, you know, the other piece of it is that the people with means, including my kid, will have the ability to access abortion because that's what happened before Roe versus Wade. And really what we need to be so focused on is making sure that everybody in this country has access to abortion and is able to make the decision for themselves, and particularly when the maternal mortality crisis in this country is so high, especially Black maternal mortality, if there is no right to abortion, people will will die. And it's not because of self-induced abortion like it was before Roe was decided. We can talk about self-induced abortion and the risks there. And it's not, it's not dangerous to take medication abortion on your own now. But what is dangerous is the inability to access abortion when there's a maternal mortality crisis and the people who will hit the hardest are Black women. And also no paid family leave. And I think that's also really important to note. Yeah, all the systemic racism um, in our country, the systemic racism in healthcare, the lack of resources, it all contributes to this as well. It's certainly all part of the problem. And I just hope that we can create the world that all young people will be proud of. Bridget, thank you so much for your work and for joining us and helping us piece through all of this. We really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening. We have a long fight ahead of us, but the ACLU was made for moments like this. To donate to support our fight against the attack on reproductive autonomy and all the attacks that follow, please visit aclu.org slash keep fighting. That's aclu.org slash keep fighting. Thank you so much for stepping up and working together with us. Until next week, stay strong.